So the footnote from the previous slide, and I was, I'm not going to do this again. There's not always going to be two slides. Uh, so what we mean by first complete scientific product, when we say that of Newton, this is not supposed to be a piece of analysis. This is just supposed to be an indication of approximately what we're getting at. Right? That we've got in, uh, in the Principia, the first mathematically structured theoretical edifice that was of unexpectedly general applicability, and right? turned out to be applied to ranges of phenomena that uh, Newton could not have imagined, or did not imagine. Um, unexpectedly general applicability that licensed a busy and widely distributed range of further investigations and products. Right? The, the, there's something about the, that Newtonian moment, that why we call it the scientific revolution, everything afterwards, so to speak, is different, and it's different. One of the important ways in which it's different is the mathematical structure. What we mean by successful, and we appeal to Mark Wilson here to understand successful in a particularly narrow way, again, the, the suggestion is not this is the only thing that counts as success. It's not, it's not again, of course not, an analysis of success. Um, it's just what we're going to use here, what, how we're going to understand good science, um, that it successfully steers between the pathologies that Mark identifies in his book, between uh, a sort of poor philosophically motivated conservatism, so uh, a refusal to allow the conceptual flux and the conceptual flexibility that is uh, important to scientific development, which is what allows it to encourage the generation of the kind of unexpected applications from the, from the mathematics. One must hear between that pathology and the alternative pathology that Mark also discusses and that Michael agrees is a uh, pathology that's an overly formalistic, hazy holism, right? The, um, the kind of formulation of theory that leaves it overly detached from testing because it, it allows one to escape from close engagement, clear engagement between empirical phenomena and, and um, conceptual and, and theoretical commitments. Now I'll offer some, start with some generalizations about these three bases for reflecting on the relationship between science and philosophy. It seems to us, and this is an opinionated slide, it seems to us that the first basis, the very liberal conception of the source of the template, coming from the scientific template, our problem is we think it draws emphasis away unduly or to, to, to an unhelpfully great extent from mathematics. That's one of the crucial things that is, is importantly different about science af after Newton. And we think that the, the, the reason we resist undue de-emphasis on the centrality of mathematics is we think that just makes it difficult to, just, to clearly distinguish science from just non-lazy reasoning in general. We don't, right, there, there's lots of, there's of non-lazy reasoning. It's good reasoning, it's hard reasoning, it's serious reasoning. That would include Plato and Aristotle, and literary criticism and, and aesthetics and all sorts of other things, um, which have lots in common with science, aside from just being non-lazy. But it can obscure the issue and make it very difficult to find. One, you want, we want to mean something a little bit more precise when we say philosophy should be motivated by science and should be, should be consistent in its objective with science. We mean something more specific by that than just philosophy should also be non-lazy activity in the sense of literary criticism. I'm very confused by this one. Maybe I should get there. I mean, the Greeks invented systematic mathematics and systematic application of mathematics. The, the, right. So, so that's why all the all the the aspects of the footnotes of the one aspect were important. Right. It's not just mathematics. So the claim is not that the claim is not that prior to Newton nobody was applying mathematics to nature. Right. The claim is. Right? That if you draw the if you draw the source of templates too liberally, 
you're going to find a lot of other elements that are driving that are at least as central to the pre-Newtonian activity, right? along with mathematics. So, so, so yes, the Greeks applied mathematics to, to phenomena, and yes, the Greeks invented mathematics, at least Western mathematics, but mathematics. Um, but um, if you're, when you're doing criticism of Aristotle, or when you're doing criticism of, of, uh, of pre-Newtonian philosophy in general, the uh, reflections on what they're up to are going to make mathematics less central, it seems to us, at least the case if you're now analyzing post-Newtonian science. The details of the mathematics and, its in, and, and the relationship between the mathematics and the empirical uh, testing become more central. And it seems to us in a qualitatively, qualitatively important way. Now basis two is Michael's, that's just which, by which I mean it's only the basis that is in fact central in Michael's work. Um, and that basis invites us to concentrate quite heavily on the things Michael concentrates on. The dialectic between Hume and Kant, right, the understanding of Kant's motivations as a reaction to Hume, on the broadly Kuhnian themes about transitions uh, across putatively incommensurable barriers over the history of science, on the dynamics of reason, and also on the that wonderful period we've been talking about extensively today, that in the nexus of mathematics, physics, and philosophy during the period across the turn of the previous century. 